Dear Lord, we do thank you for this day, and we do pray, God, that you will get us through some of these technical difficulties. Lord, you're good, and we know you're coming. And I do believe, God, when we preach the word, the devil, the devil does hinder God. And we know there's certain things that he really hinders when he has a stronghold or something that he's got us bound in deception. Now I do pray, God, that you will help. Help us understand, Lord. Give us the fullness of your spirit in preaching as well as hearing, Lord. We love you. Come quickly, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. I tell you what, I, I, I'm going to preach today on when no is not enough. When no is not enough. Take a look at um, up here, Judges chapter 15. And they said unto him, We are come down to bind thee, that we may deliver thee into the hand of the Philistines. And Samson said unto them, Swear unto me that you will not fall upon me yourselves. And they spake unto him, saying, No, but we will bind thee fast and deliver thee into their hand, but surely we will not kill thee. I'm trying to go through the Bible and find places where people said no. Now, in this case, they're actually promising what the other person desires. So they're not negating, they're agreeing with it. So we're looking for places where somebody says no, meaning I'm not going to do what you want me to do. We can go to 1 Samuel 1. And Eli said unto her, How long will thou be drunken? Put away thy wine from thee. That's obviously not grape juice in that context. And Hannah answered and said, No, my Lord. I am a woman of a sorrowful spirit. She's not saying, no, I'm not going to put away my wine. She's saying, whoa, no, 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 you got this all wrong about me. I'm a woman of a sorrowful spirit. I have drunk neither wine nor strong drink, but have poured out my soul before the Lord. Count not thy handmaid for a daughter of Belial. Well, I think that's a powerful verse right there. And it says, you think I'm a devil worshiper? That you would accuse me of... of, of Drinking alcoholic wine? So in this case, the reply is a respectful but firm denial, not of what he wants her to do, but a correction of the accusation or the assumption that Eli was making against her. 1 Kings chapter 3. He had two harlots, and both of them had a child. And there's probably alcohol involved and all types of things. I mean, that's a rough life, a wicked life. But we know what happened is one of the mothers was nursing in the bed at night, and then she smothered her child. And so what she did was she ran over while the other one was sleeping and stole her baby and put her dead baby with the mother, the other mother. So then they go before the king. And the first one that stole the baby made her statement, this baby's mine. And that brings us to verse 22. And this, meaning the mother, the real mother, or the mother of the, the child that, that died, this said, I'm sorry, the, the mother of the, um, who had her baby stolen. And this says, no, but the dead is thy son, and the living is my son. Thus spake, they, thus they spake before the king. So again, we have a correction, just in the case of Hannah. What we see is sin leads to lying. This woman stole after this horrible tragedy happened, this woman stole somebody else's child, then lies. And we see that lying spirit over and over again in the Bible. 
comes from sin. It is sin, but sin always leads to more sin. So we're looking for a place where there's not merely a correction of facts, but a denial of desire or demand. We'll look in Isaiah chapter 30. For thus saith the Lord God, the Holy One of Israel, in returning and rest shall you be saved. In quietness and in confidence shall be your strength, and ye would not. But you said no, for we will flee upon horses. Therefore shall you flee, and we will ride upon the swift. Therefore shall they that pursue you be swift. What's going on here is God's people said, I don't have to fear Babylon. We don't have to do what you say. Uh, or put it this way, they're, they're saying, uh, uh, I don't have to fear your warnings because we have made a league with Egypt and we're going to get out of here on horses. We'll be saved from the Assyrian power. And so God is saying, if you'll just do what I say in this national calamity, if you'll do what I say, if you'll return to me and be obedient, You'll be saved and you'll have quietness. Confidence shall be your strength. But you just won't do things my way. And, and we see this over and over in the Bible. People just stubborn, headstrong, stiff-necked. And God says, why don't you just do it my way? And they said, no, I'm going to do it my way. They lean to their feelings. They lean to their own understanding about things. And, and they don't think for a second, surely God knows so much more than I do. Surely my parents know more than I do. Uh, you know, spiritual leaders, uh, and, and, and believe me, I know there's a lot of blind leaders. But there's a lot of rebellion in this age. And the Bible predicted that in this day and age we're living in, look at Second Peter, look at Jude. It says there's going to come a time. When they will despise government, they won't listen to authority. In fact, whatever you tell them, they're going to do the opposite, no matter how stupid it is, no matter how destructive it is. And then when the brain starts to mature, and then they learn some lessons the hard way, then they say, oh, wow, I learned a lot of lessons, and I'm a lot wiser now. And praise God for that. I hope you get that wisdom. But it's better to listen. It's like a child wanting to run across the road. The mother says, no, don't do that. And um, the, the child doesn't understand at a certain age why certain things are wrong. But, but, the, but, but the man, is uh, uh, the, there's a little kitty here. He wants me to come pet it. He's calling me over to the car. The, they don't understand danger. It's like a little lamb I had that at night, uh, or it would start getting dark, and he, she would go over by the edge of the woods and have no sense whatsoever that she needs to get over here close to the house and come back home and, and get taken care of. So that's how we are. We wander. We get into things. Now, listen. They want to do things their own way, and we see this throughout the prophets. Here's Jeremiah 42. But if you say, we will not dwell in this land, neither obey the voice of the Lord your God, saying, no, but we will go into the land of Egypt, where we shall see no war nor hear the sound of the trumpet, nor have hunger of bread, and there will we dwell. So this is definitely the case of Babylon here, and they're saying that Egypt will be our friend. And, uh, you know, whatever power they are in league with or trying to yoke with, we always look at things sometimes when we're in rebellion and we say, I have a way out. No, no, I have something that's going to help me. i got all these plans, and it's all going to work out. And it never does work out. At least not in the long run. So here we have somebody telling someone no. And it's God's people telling God no. That's sad. You know the verse we quote off in Jeremiah chapter 6. Thus saith the Lord, stand you in the ways and see and ask for the old paths. Where is the good way? And walk therein, and you shall find rest for your souls. Again, over and over, he promises rest, 
quietness, blessing. If you'll just do things my way. Do things the old way, the, the, the way they used to. Before they got stupid and rebellious. But they said, we will not walk therein. They just tell God, I'm not going to do it that way. That's a horrible way to do things. I'm not going to do things your way. You're trying to turn me into a pilgrim. You, you, you're trying to make me like some old fogey or something, you know. Hey, we better get back to some basic common sense about life, man. I mean, they're living like dogs now. They're living like animals. We have been debased as a culture. God says, I set watchmen over you. God raises up leaders saying, hearken to the sound of the trumpet. Hear the warning. See the danger you're in. But they said, we will not hearken. We got a lot of people telling God no in the Bible. A lot of times God says, just do it this way. And they say, no. No, we're not going to do it that way. Jeremiah 44, as for the word that thou hast spoken unto us. Now, these are the women talking. The women were stirred up and, and, and worshiping idols and worshiping the queen of heaven and, and doing all of these things. And uh, they were leading their men. And they tell Jeremiah, as for the word that thou hast spoken unto us in the name of the Lord, we will not hearken unto thee. But we will certainly do whatsoever thing goeth forth out of our own mouth to burn incense unto the queen of heaven. We're going to do it our way. I have heard of churches where a fellow just stood up, just a meek pastor. Uh, it didn't mean he was weak, but, but in, in this case, he sounded pretty weak. But he decided, hey, we're just going to, uh, we need to have, people need to quit living together. Y'all been doing this for years. We got fornication in our church. And, and those women ran him out of that church. I have heard over and over, women ran the pastor out. I don't know how that happens, but I tell you what, it happened in this case. And uh, there's a lot of situations like that. And believe me, it's not just women that have gone bad. The men went bad a long time before it. But we have a mess today. You know, the Satanists, the, 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 the infamous evil Satanists, they say the key to Satanism is just do whatever you want to do. Do it your own way. That's Satanism. Do what thou wilt shall be the whole of the law. God's saying do it my way. Don't lean to your own understanding. Do things my way. And that's, you got to decide if you're going to be a fool, a follower of rebellious people, or we're just going to do things God's way. If you do it God's way, you get saved from a whole lot. It doesn't mean that you're not going to suffer for God. It doesn't mean that people aren't going to persecute you. It doesn't mean you won't go through trials. But what it does mean, you'll have rest in your conscience. You'll have peace. And you'll be saved from so many hard knocks that transgressors go through. Rebels have to go through all kinds of trouble that they make for themselves. Oh, so often in the Bible, we see God's people telling God no when it comes to blessing and rest because they don't like the conditions. You know, I've told you for years that, that, that people ask me in a store, or ask me at Whole Foods or someplace, and they say, you know, how do you get your children to obey like that and, and, and be at peace and end up? Uh, Many times I would tell them and they would say, I knew that's what you were going to say. In other words, you knew all along what to do. Now, sometimes people don't know what to do, but in many cases, they know what to do. But they said it's just so hard in this day and age to do things the right way. That's really the problem because nobody's helping you do things right. Unless you go into a church where a pastor is trying to exhort you to do right, you got the Holy Spirit trying to urge you in your conscience, but you can bury him out of sight and try to basically uh, get distracted with all the things of the world. And the spirit of this age is going to be telling you, do it this way, away from God. And it is hard. It is hard, especially when you sit before all the people telling you to do it the wrong way. Yes, it gets hard when you do it like that. But if you'll turn that junk off and get right with God, it's amazing how easier living holy becomes. 
you just got to quit giving Satan ammunition. We got to quit giving him power by listening to his servants. But my main point today is not to search for the exact language of no throughout the scriptures. The point is to teach us, remind us that no is not good enough in many situations. What I'm trying to tell you is this is a devil's trick. The devil knows that often, at first, he can't say, w w will you uh, get a pentagram tattoo and, and w will you just uh, dress up and, and honor Satan? Uh, he knows. He has to disguise it and make you think you're doing right and make you think that it's God's fault that you can't live holy, see? So one of the things is, he is glad if you'll sit back and say, well, I said no. I said no. And what I'm trying to tell you is God never said, just say no. That, that, that's never his message. In most cases, to just say no. And I'm going to prove that to you here in a minute. If you merely rely on saying no, even if you mean it, it's going to ruin you. It's going to bring you to judgment. Now, God forbid, I don't mean say yes to the devil. <laughs> what I'm trying to tell you is no is not good enough. The title of the message is when no is not enough. Sometimes it should be enough in certain situations, but there are certain conflicts and situations and battles when no is not enough. Even when it is, even when it is the right answer, it's not the total response that we're called to make. That's the point. And if you don't get that straight, the devil will get us. Look over here in Genesis 39. It came to pass after these things that his master's wife cast her eyes upon Joseph and she said, lie with me. See, that was a culture that had fallen this Egyptian culture. And the Lord was calling his people out of that culture. And he says, don't learn their ways. Don't walk in their ways. He's going to say that later but when he calls his people out and they come out of Egypt. So you see that uh, when women go bad, when women become just blatantly, openly, everybody's uh, born with sin. Everybody needs Jesus. But I'm saying when, uh, when a culture finally when, when women begin to no longer have any restraint, any shame whatsoever, you're living in a civilization that's not sustainable anymore. It's over. It, it's over. Unless there's a revival to somehow, uh, unless some women become mothers and start calling, and, I, and I'll tell you, I'll, I'll preach on this later, uh, God's raising up some people of the world that, that, that barely even know Jesus to start calling women back. What are we doing with all this feminism? What are we doing with all this? And they're trying to call them back. And, and sometimes they don't even know what they're doing. They're just like, I got to be a mama. Nobody else. Where are the Christian women? Nobody is telling these women that this is wrong. This is shameful. Somebody's got a mama. Somebody's got to be the parent. And when nobody wants to be the, the one that stands up and says, no, we're done. We are done as a nation. So listen, she wanted, she was married to the master of Joseph because Joseph had been betrayed and sold as a slave. And she said, she cast her eyes on it and she said, lie with me. But he refused. He said, no. And he said unto his master's wife, behold, my master wanteth not what is with me in the house, and he hath committed all that he hath to my hand. He said, do you understand? Your husband trusts me. There is none greater in this house than I. Neither hath he kept back anything from me but thee, because thou art his wife. 
And can I do this great wickedness and sin against God? And it came to pass. As she spake to Joseph day by day, and he hearkened not unto her to lie by her or to be with her. This is, this is, this is a serious situation. On one side, he wants to expose her, but this is a young man and he's a righteous man and he's trying to figure out what to do. He's trying to stay away from her, but she keeps finding him and, 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 and trying to proposition him and proposition him. And he keeps saying, no, 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 I'm not going to do this thing. He tried to say no. And it came to pass about this time that Joseph went into the house to do his business. And there was none of the men of the house there within. Joseph probably didn't even know that. You know. And she caught him by his garment. Now she's grabbing him. This is attempted rape. And she caught him by his garment saying, lie with me. And he left his garment in her hand and fled and got him out. Do you see the point? Did Joseph stand there and just say no? No, he learned really quick. No is not good enough for this woman. And now she's got him. She's got a good grip on him. So he tore himself from her and ran away, leaving the garment, probably his outer shirt or his outer garment, uh, just leaving it there in her hand. And of course now, hey, she understands. Uh, she does what a lot of bad women do. When she doesn't get what she wants, I'll just falsely accuse him and play the victim. And that's what she does. And Joseph ends up in prison. Joseph ends up in prison. And he's done nothing but serve God. And now he's in prison. But I'm going to tell you something. Listen. There is a time where you cannot just say no to people or the devil. You have to flee. You have to flee the situation that you're in. He fled. No was not enough. This is the point of my message. When no is not enough. In the 1980s, when Nancy Reagan, the president's wife, launched a campaign or participated in a campaign called the War on Drugs, the slogan was, just say no. And it was on T-shirts, signs, all around schools. You'd see posters. Just say no. Just say no. Just say no. And you know what happened? We still ended up with the biggest drug culture you can ever imagine. Even worse drugs. Well, well, what happened? And, and look, listen to how it's phrased. Just say no. I'm going to tell you, that's a satanic campaign. Leaving aside government and, and all of these things, leaving aside the intention of what they meant. Some of these folks were trying to do what's right. We just got to teach our kids to say no. But that's not a biblical message. In fact, you're even phrasing it in a way that's very antichrist. Just say no. Meaning that's all you got to do is just say no. That doesn't work. It didn't work for millions of kids. Now, I wish more would say no to a whole lot of drugs. Not just illegal street drugs. But the drugs that a corrupt government 
and corrupt big pharma and corrupt big food industry are sticking inside the food. Because I'm telling you, your body can only take so much of trans drugs coming through the food with pesticides, antibiotics, hormones, and everything you can imagine. How long can you take that? You're born in this world and you get it. You're 10 years old, you get it. You're 14, you get it. You're 15, you get it. You're 18, you get it. You're 19, you're 20, you're 21. After time, I'll tell you, by the time you're 30, your body can't take it anymore. And people will go crazy, but I'm telling you, there's... There's women by the time they're 29, 30 years old, they've lost much of their femininity. And the men have lost much of their masculinity. And it ages us and it makes us die. And I wish more would just say no to drugs. But it's hard to say no to drugs when it's everywhere. People write me and they say, how do I eat? How do I live? I want to say no to these things. I said, it, it, it's not easy, but God... Pray for your daily food. Pray for your daily food. Say, Lord, give me good, wholesome food to eat. And he'll show you ways. But when people say, just say no to whatever's bad, it's not the full picture. That's not the direction that God has given us. The full directions. Joseph did more than just say no. The Bible says that when a woman is attacked, just like Joseph was, but by a man, it doesn't say that she's just to say no. By all, by, by all means, she's to say no. But she is to resist, and she's to scream. She's to scream. Don't let somebody... In a Walmart parking lot, say, get in the car. And you say, well, I just had to go get in the car. I, I mean, I, I tell you what, it's not going to end well. Scream. Scream. The Bible says wherever you're at, scream. If you're female. Don't go along with a kidnapper or somebody. Flee if you can. But always scream. Always scream. My point is... The message of God was not just say no. In fact, they even would stone to death a woman if she was in the city. Now, they're not going to understand that today. But they would have stoned a woman because she's going to say I was raped. And you know what the magistrate would say? And God told them that this was the law. The magistrate would say, well, you're in the city. Why didn't you scream? Why didn't you scream? I said no. Why didn't you scream? Now what if it's not a violent assault? It's still a proposition. Is the message just say no to sexual lust? Is the message just say no? That, that's not the message, folks. Look at this. Tell me if that's the message. New Testament. 1 Corinthians chapter 6. Flee fornication. Ah. Why didn't it say just say no to fornication? You've got a whole generation that doesn't understand this. And when somebody tries to teach it to them, there's a great outcry. You know why there's such an outcry to principals in public schools, to teachers, to fathers? You know why there's such an outcry to pastors that preach this message that I'm preaching today? Because it works. And the devil knows it works. And there's people that want to destroy this country that knows it works. So they're going to call you a fundamentalist. They're going to call you a radical. They're going to say all these things because they know this message works. God's ways work. Flee fornication. That's God's message. For you are bought with a price. God owns your body. If you're a Christian, God owns your body. He owns everything. But in a special way, he owns you. 
Therefore, glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. See, I'm not going to sit here and think these bad things. My mind belongs to God. I'm not going to do bad things in my body. My body belongs to God. It's the vessel, the temple of the Holy Ghost. You're tempted to fornication in some form. Flee, says the Bible. Run. Remove yourself from that situation. Get away from that person. He said, but she's, she's tempting me. Every day she's tempting me. Proverbs 5 said, here's the Bible way. I've told her no over and over. No, here's the Bible way. Remove thy way far from her. You got to go to a different store. You got to go to a different place. Remove thy way far from her. You got to take care of it somehow. You've got to get out of the situation and come not nigh the door of her house. Don't even come near. That's the Bible way. Doesn't it make sense? Isn't it just common, basic sense? It should be. This is proof that it should be. He says in Proverbs 7, And behold, among the simple ones, that means somebody's just a fool. Ain't got no sense, man. You do, you do got people out here that sometimes just do not have sense. Basic sense. They're just simple, but not in a, a good way, not in a wholesome way. They're simple in the sense, man, you, you just don't, something's wrong with your, with your mind, fella. You don't apply it. I beheld among the simple ones, I discern among the youths, usually it's a young person, hopefully you get older, you'll start having some sense, but sometimes there's even old people that ain't got no sense. A young man void of understanding. There it is, he's void of it. Passing through the street near her corner. Just, just, well, why'd you go home that way, man? You know that's where that bad woman is? That woman that's been after you? That adulterous woman, you know she's there. Why are you why are you there? Well, why, why are you messing around with certain websites? Oh, I didn't want to do anything bad. You know there's bad stuff there. Why are you messing around with certain movies? Oh well, I like the mystery. I like I know, but there's a strange woman in there, and you know that they put that in there just to ensnare you into porn. It's there. They're just giving you an excuse. Why are you going near her corner? And he went the way to her house in the twilight, in the evening. No accountability at all. Nobody to tell you, hey, don't go this way, man. Let's get away from here. Why are we in this neighborhood, man? In the black and dark night. You just ain't got common sense, man. Messing around online, online in the middle of the night, no accountability, no nothing anywhere. You got to apply biblical principles. Somebody says, Pastor, I, I just can't stop porn, man. I got ensnared. It probably happened gradually, breaking down step by step what you thought was shameful. And then one day you're doing stuff and you just can't justify it. You know you've gone too far. But you say, how do I stop? I'm just saying no. I'm just saying no. I'm just, Who told you to just say no? Where is that in the Bible? That's your problem. You're saying, no, 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 no. You've got an addiction, man. How do you stop an addiction? You've got to pray for God's strength, and you've got to believe in God's strength, but then you have to fight, and you have to do it God's way. If you don't fight God's way, you will not win this battle. Whether it's some online fornication form of it, or whether it's literal. So well, what's God's way? Remove 
every avenue that the devil has and stay away from the devil's avenue. I've told fellas, he says, well, I got to stay in a hotel and so and so. I say, go inside that hotel. I I I've done it plenty of times. N not even tempted. I I've just done it just for, just for common sense sake. Go in there. And I, I brought the TV up to the front counter. I'm not trying to be holding. Nobody's there. Nobody even knows. Here's the TV. Why are you bringing the TV here? I don't want it in the room. I don't know what junk you got on there. What if I turn on the news or something? You, you, you got to be proactive about the devil. Don't get near it. That's God's way. Don't get near it. And behold, there met him a woman with the attire of a harlot, whether he planned it or not, and subtle of heart. She is loud and stubborn, her feet abide not in her house, and these evil spirits are out there, and they're around these places, and around these things, and around these movies, and around these websites, and they're in places where you ought not be at night. Loud, stubborn women with the attire of a harlot, with her much fair speech, she caused him to yield. It's as if he didn't want to yield. Why am I here? I shouldn't even be here. Well, you shouldn't have went, you shouldn't have went near her. With the flattering of her lips, she forced him. It's as if she had this power over him. And what she says, don't even think about it. That's what she's going to say. Don't even think about it. I shouldn't be doing this. Oh, your, your husband's a good man. No, no, don't even think about it. Just hush. Just, let's talk about it tomorrow. Just right now, just, just go with. Let not thy heart decline to her ways. Go not astray in her paths. That means before your feet ever start going near her house and you realize you're starting to say, I think I kind of want, want to walk this way. I don't want to do anything bad. You know, I, I'm a Christian. I'm trying to live holy. I'm just going to kind of walk that way. No, no, you're already letting your mind go astray. You're letting the loins of your mind. So what the Bible saying is, guard up the loins of your mind. Quit thinking of these thoughts. Cast down these thoughts. Don't let your mind go astray. And then your feet won't go astray. But buddy, you find your feet going the wrong place. You're going to end up in sin. You're going to end up in sin. You're going to say, how did this happen? How did I lose power or feel like I lost power? You let your heart go. You quit being in control of your mind and your thoughts. You didn't keep your heart. And then you didn't keep your feet. Listen to this. For she hath cast down many wounded, yea, many strong men have been slain by her. The Bible said it. strong men have been slain by her. I think that has to refer to not just physical strength. I think it has to refer to strong in, I'm not manipulated. I'm not easily manipulated. And you're going to have this proud fellow, strong. He said, I'm not going to be manipulated by a woman. No, I, I do what I want to do. And all of a sudden now he's just turned into absolute weakness. You say, well, if a woman has that type of power, who can stand? You can stand if you do it God's way. You can stand if you do it God's way. He said, no temptation ha ha hath taken us, but to such as is common to man, and he will not allow us to be tempted above that which we're able. But you got to do things God's way. You can't go knock on her door, enter into her house, eat with her, and say, God, why did I fall into sin with that man's wife? I thought I was stronger than that. You're a fool, that's why. Stay away from her. Her house is the way to hell. Going down to the chambers of death. For a saved person, that's not a loss of eternal salvation. But I'm going to tell you what. That's judgment. That's misery. That's terror. You better see what the Lord said. If your eye offend thee, pluck it out. If your hand offend thee, cut it off. The whole point is get away from anything that tempts you the best you can. Now, I understand we live in a cursed world right now. Temptations are everywhere. And uh, the Bible said, turn out to the left or to the right. 
But we got to do our best. And God will be with us. And when you do have power to leave a situation, we need to do it. There's young women that say they leave their daddy's house, mama's house, and they go off into college, which is just one last attempt of the world to indoctrinate you into humanism and everything that's evil. And they say, now just say no. Just say no to fornication. Just say no to drugs. And, and they go there, and if they haven't already lost their purity, they lose it in college. And they say, how did this happen? Well, they tried to be strong. And they said, I'll just go to this party. And then they find out there's alcohol there, and they don't leave because they don't want to be mean. They don't want to embarrass themselves, or what are you, some type of goody Christian or something? And then before you know it, they're like, just take a sip. It's Kool-Aid. It tastes sweet. Just take a sip. I don't want you to get drunk. I don't drink either. I, I don't get drunk, but just take a sip. And she can't remember anything that happened after that. And you would not believe the millions of girls could say it happened just like that. Just like that. I was in the wrong place. A wise girl, I once heard her say, telling other girls, especially young girls, she says, I'm not better or stronger than you are. I'm just smarter than you are. I don't put myself in foolish situations. Thinking I'm strong. Just say no. Is that the whole truth? No. Let's see about all, all these people struggling with alcohol. Spoke with a dear fella down in Arkansas. God bless you if you're listening. And uh, I had to give him this 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 teaching as he was struggling and. Going back to, to his sin. The Bible says, just say no to the wine. Is that what it says? Just say no to the wine? Is that God's message to not be a drunkard? Look not thou upon the wine. You say, but it's everywhere, especially if, in Missouri and states that lock it into their state law. Gas station, Walmart. You got to go down the aisle. You got to go down that aisle and just gaze at it. Sometimes they put it right before you, but you know what? When it's right before you, curse it. Speak against it as the evil that it is. Keep yourself in God's spirit and Try to find places where you don't got to sit there and look at that stuff. You say, well, I'm not even tempted at it. Well, don't even give your, your, yourself an opportunity to be tempted. They make the, the, the bottles all pretty and shiny, you know, and, and just different shapes. And, and they, they make things appealing with their commercials. Just say no. Oh, I want you to say no, but the Bible says go beyond that. The Bible says look not thou upon the wine. The Bible says don't even look at it. You say, well, I, I'm not going to drink a whole bunch. The Bible doesn't say drink moderately. The Bible says don't even look at it. There's a type of wine the Bible says don't look at. It. And there's a type of wine the Bible says be moderate with. One has alcohol, the other does not. Want to make you drunk, the other does not. We should be moderate with all food, all drink. God didn't want us to be a glutton. But when it comes to alcohol, it's not try to be moderate. And I'm not going to go down that road because I can tell you story after story of people that say, well, we were over in Europe and that's where I grew up. And we drink wine with every meal. And, and my parents, they're not drunkards. And I've seen the same parents not able to walk. Ten years later, I've seen the parents not even, they're bumping into walls as I'm preaching downtown. I'm like, there are those good Christian parents that taught their daughter it's okay to drink moderately and 
Here they are, can't even walk now. And then I've seen the daughter in all kinds of sin and all kinds of hell and total absolute alcohol addiction, a drunkard. Don't you give me that idea. Well, I can just look at it and do it moderate. No, the Bible says flee sin. Don't look at sin. Get away from sin. I'll say it again. 2 Timothy 2. Flee also youthful lust. Wherever you see it in the Bible, it says run from it. Get away from it. Don't just say no. I don't know what happened. It must be God's fault. I said no. How did I end up in sin? Flee also youthful lust. But, but hold on a second. Follow righteousness. People said, you know, I saw sin over there and, and I got away from it. But righteousness was over there with God's people. Did you get with them? Well, I went to church. Did you get around the people that were living right and that you know were living right? Who do you surround yourself with? Who are your friends? Who are the people you want to be with? Be youthful us, but follow righteousness, faith, charity, peace with them. They call on the Lord out of a pure heart. Not the people that are faking it. People grow up in homeschool and they can fake it for a while until God begins to whip them and teach them a, a good lesson. And he's going to teach them later. I hope they'll listen. But if you already got stubborn and you can't hear nothing, you can't hear your parents, you can't hear the preacher, maybe you're not even going to hear God when he starts shaking you up, buddy. I hope you will hear him. Leave you here in the tribulation period. Maybe you'll wake up then. I don't know. If not, you'll stand before God at the judgment seat of Christ. He'll deal with it then. But I pray we'll hear God right now. And here's the message. Listen to me, sister. Listen to me, brother. Flee youthful lust. Get away from anything that tempts you the bad way. And get around people that are holy. Get around the best people. Get around those that fear God. Get around those that you know aren't faking it. Don't hang out with the people that said, hey, you know, you take all this stuff seriously. Boy, I don't take it seriously. I think it's extreme. Don't you? Yeah, I think. Get away from people like that, man. We're not playing around. I've seen too much. I've seen that mess for 30 years. I saw it before I became a Christian. Get away from these types of people. They want you hang out with so-and-so no more. I love them. I pray for them. But I can't hang out with them. They lead me into sin. See, or, or they put a bad spirit in you. You've you, you got to decide if you want to be holy or not. If you want to be holy and you want to please God, if God died for you and loves you and you love him, then you have to do things his way. And you have to say, I, I, I don't want to do anything that will hurt my Lord. I got to. And God said, here's how you do it. Get away from bad. Get the good people. And start trying to be more holy. Start growing in faith and charity and peace and righteousness. Here it is. This is what I told a brother not long ago. He that walketh with wise men shall be wise. But a companion of fools shall be destroyed. Why is that? Because they rub off on you, man. You get around people that don't drink alcohol. Listen, I went through a divorce situation. Uh, my, my parents divorced around 12. And somehow or another, God grabbed a hold of me and put me around Christians in a summer camp. And then somehow or another, they, they called me to be a, a camp counselor at, at like 13. And so what happened was my whole summers for year after year after year were spent. I didn't go back home. I stayed all summer there in the pine trees. Others would go home the weekend. I'd stay there. They'd have me stay there the whole weekend on the whole camp until everybody comes back and I do it again next week. And I had two worlds that were in such conflict. Because my camp folks, they were all older than me and they didn't drink. They didn't fornicate. They didn't do bad stuff. But I had to leave that world and then go into a different world around my neighborhood and, and, and where I was in the wintertime. And, and I just had conflict. But I learned something. 
I learned you don't even think about drinking. You don't even think about being bad. We, we play games. We have fun. Uh, you, you don't need all that sin to have fun. Why don't I even think about those things? Because I'm around people that are wise. But you get around fools, and they don't know how to have fun without being a fool. And the Bible says, who you hang around, I, I mean, when you hang around with them and, and, and you know, if, you, if you're a boss at work or something, that's different. But what I'm trying to tell you is when you're just going out with people, you're going to become like them. You're going to become like them. And it goes for whatever you're doing on the Internet. Because in, in, in some way, the movies you listen to, the music you listen to, the websites you go to, the games and the people that play, all of that, those become your friends. That's who you're walking with. You say, well, I'm trying to do good, Mom. I'm trying to do good, but uh, I, I just don't know what the problem is. Do good God's way. Try that. Of course, they're going to then say, but these are my friends, and I, I love them. I like them. Well, you got to love Jesus. you got to love Jesus more. He says, you can't be my disciple if you put somebody before me. Let me tell you a few more things. If you really love people, get right with God so you can be a light to these people. God says, you've never loved anybody until you love him and keep his commandments. That's the best way to love people. Well, let's look at the nations real quick. Republicans slam Biden's don't deterrence. Every time he says don't, they do. Republicans argue Biden failed to deter Iran. Fox News. Telegraph tells us Western appeasement of Iran has failed, says the Shah's son. Iran's exiled prince. He said, there, here's the Shah of Iran that's been explained. He said, you, want, you know why these people, you know why my nation is doing whatever they want? Because you're just saying no, no. But you've never showed them that you mean no. It's appeasement. He said there had been a weak approach by Western leaders on both sides of the Atlantic. He argued the root cause was the West policy of appeasement. Now, sooner or later, sooner or later, this spirit will be in the West. And we're, we're in the West in the Bible. It says one day Russia is going to attack Israel. It's just as clear as can be. Our forefathers understood it. Back when Russia, people were like having even had trouble trying to understand why that would ever be. And it says Russia is going to be lined up with Iran. And Russia and Iran together are going to come against Israel. And right now Russia and Iran are leagued together. This prophecy isn't being fulfilled yet, but you're getting close. Put it this way, it's stage setting for it. But here's what's going to happen. Russia's not going away. Russia is coming after Israel in the Bible, in the future, and Iran's not going away. Russia and Iran leaked together are coming against Israel soon. I say soon. I don't know how many years, but uh, it's going to happen. But listen to what the West says. Sheba and Dedan and the merchants of Tarshish. Many believe those are the European Western powers there. With all the young lions thereof. That's all the nations that came out of that. So if you look at it as England, you can see Australia, America, th these Western powers over here where or, 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 or the powers rooted. Shall say unto thee, here's what they're saying to, to, to Russia and Iran, art thou come to take a spoil? Has thou gathered thy company to take a prey, to carry away silver and gold, to take away cattle and goods, to take a great spoil? Many of our forefathers said this is weakness. They're powerless to do anything. They're not saying, hey, you go over there and attack Israel. We're coming after you, or we're going to stop you, or we're going to give them weapons. No, no, they're saying that there's going to come a time when they have no power to do anything. All they do is talk. All they do is talk. All they do is talk. 
to whatever degree America should be involved. You know, we'll discuss all that, debate it, all of that. that that's not my point today. My point today right now is that there are situations where you telling somebody no or trying to appease them doesn't work. Obama's little lines, if you cross this line, if you cross this line, it, it doesn't work. It doesn't work. It doesn't work with bullies. It doesn't work with crazy people. It doesn't work with people that want to spread their agenda around the world. Proverbs 29 says, a servant will not be corrected by words. For though he understand, he will not answer. That means he won't do what you say. Now, obviously, that's not every servant. There are good employees, there's good servants that will do what you say. And all you got to do is speak. There's good children. All you got to do is just say the word and they'll do it. But there's going to, it's not in every case or even the majority of cases. Somebody that tries to rule anything with just words is a fool. And he's not going to be a good leader. I could see that at 13 years old. I would see a camp fella with a cabin of kids and he's screaming and screaming. I hear him over there screaming and yelling. And he's turning red and he's going out and he's, he's almost crying. He comes red in the face and he's like, oh, they won't do anything I say. I said, man, you're, you're, you're acting like an idiot. You can't sit here and just go crazy and scream at them. Now they know they got power to manipulate you. I learned that at 13 years old, man. And then you see the other fellow trying to be a buddy, just a total buddy, and nobody has fun. None of the kids have fun all week because there's just that they're always coming in last everything. They can't clean their cabin. They can't do anything. Everything's out of control. Oh, but he's your buddy. Yeah, but you sure had a horrible time at camp because the other kids walked all over him. Can't just use words. All it took was one time. Say, I tell you what, if, if y'all don't get straight, we'll stay in here while everybody's going swimming. And you just do it one time. You got the best kid the whole rest of the week. They say, he'll back it up, man. He'll back it up. He doesn't just use words. It's great when you can just use words. But there's a time when words are not enough. There are people that want to be the tail in everything. They're made to be servants. Or put it this way, uh, that, that's how they want to live. They're always trying to get ahead, but they end up being servants in everything. I don't mean the, the, the way the Lord says to serve others. I don't mean that they're godly. I mean, there's these people. They're what the Bible calls the bad way to be a servant. And Solomon's given us wisdom of life here. There are certain people, there are certain types of people that, that, that unless you make them do it, they're not going to do it. Now, you only got so much power. With man's law and with God's law, there's only so much power to make somebody to be holy. But, but you've got to do whatever is possible in your power to back things up in a godly way. I'm not talking about some horrible, abusive way, but in a godly way. There's always going to be people that if you're kind, they think that's weakness. And it doesn't mean don't be kind. You're going to be gracious, humble, meek. And because they are what they are, they're this type of person. They're going to think that's weakness. And you're going to look at them like you're crazy. This isn't weakness, man. Okay, this isn't weakness. I'm trying to be kind. I'm trying to be patient. You're mistaking that as weakness, bro. That's not weakness. John Gill says, especially one that is of a servile, surly, and untractable disposition. Geneva notes, he who is of a servile and rebellious nature. You're not going to be able to use just words. A servant. And never let your kids become this person. Don't let it be bound in them to where they become that. I mean, when they're two years old, you can... I'm not saying you're totally getting rid of the sin 
tendency in them. But a lot of times you get this over while they're toddlers. It's almost like you never have to spank again. They say, well, I think you're abusive. I think you're abusive. Uh, I meant just always screaming and yelling and throwing things and kicking and swinging. At the, uh, I meant, God forbid, let's do it while they're young and, 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 and get them to understand why they mean business. You say, what do you mean? I mean, you're at a conference. You, you got your little boy. You said, be still, sit here on this pew, be quiet. And he looks over at you and says, I bet because we're in public and you got all these people around. I bet daddy doesn't mean business right now. I can get away with whatever I want to get with. I say, oh, really? Let's go outside. We're going to the men's bathroom. Just do it once. Just do it once. You'd be in Whole Foods. It takes a long time to get a bunch of kids out of car seats. You know what it's like trying to get five kids out of car seats? Well, all of them will be in car seats at the same time, but I tell you. And then they start thinking, I know how long it took. We're in Whole Foods? Or we're, we're the health food store? I bet I can get away with whatever I want to get away with. I say, okay. Let's put everything back. Where are we going? We're going out in the car. Put you in the car seat again. And we're driving somewhere. <laughs> we're going to drive somewhere. And woo! You tell me that a kid don't realize, wow, he means business. He'll stop whatever he's doing. It doesn't matter what public thing you're in. It doesn't matter what store. He's going to mean business. You can't get away with something like that. See, that's consistency. It's not like the kids at the post office one time that uh, I told you about him. We're in this big line. The kid's going crazy. Everybody's looking at it like, boy, horrible how people are raising kids all day. These kids are just stirring up everything, climbing the walls, messing with everything. Mother said, don't do that. No, 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 don't do that. No, no. I was over there by one of the kids, and I've told this story before. I heard one kid say to his brother, has she counted to 10 yet? What number is she on? I said, this is absolutely insanity. That is how the majority of people raise kids in America. Oh, no, don't do that. Don't do that. Hey, hey, I said stop. No, 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 no. I said stop. Stop. Don't you make me mad. Now, now, now you teach all kids to gamble. You never know when they're going to get really, really, really mad and go psycho on you. But it's probably not going to be if she's just at four. And I got a few more numbers here to send. Do whatever, do whatever I want. That's how kids are raised. I say, well, what would you do different? Should you just go over to the little kid and say, pop, pop. Then tell them what they did wrong. And say, every time you do wrong. And yeah, then they'll test you. They'll test you. I don't mean leave marks all over a kid, abuse a kid. It's, it's just so simple. It really is simple. Servant who is so not only in condition, but also in temper of his mind. Disingenuous, perverse, stubborn. Vincent says he was of a servile nature. These people aren't going to. I tell you what. You, you're not going to be able to, to just tell these people. You got to show consequences. Matthew Henry says good uses to a servant does not mean indulgence, which would ruin even a child. The body is a servant to the soul. Those that humor it and are over tender of it will find it forgets its place. Bible says, Paul says he keeps his body under him. He doesn't let his body control him. David says he humbled his body, his soul, by fasting. Judgments are prepared for scorners and strike for the back of fools. Why didn't he say words? Why didn't he say words? Words are prepared for scorners. Words. For the back of fools. It doesn't say that. It doesn't say that. That's not in the Bible.
Now the sons of Eli were sons of Belial. Belial. They knew not the Lord. Now Eli was very old and he heard all that his sons did unto Israel and how they lay with the women that assembled at the door of the tabernacle of the congregation. They were like preachers. Preachers that had gone bad, wicked. They're supposed to be examples. And what did Eli, as the magistrate of the land, as well as their father, what did he do? Oh, what did he do? He said, nay, my sons. He told them no. Aren't you glad he told them no? For it is no good report that I hear. You make the Lord's people to transgress. You're being a bad example. It's one of the saddest things in the Bible. He said, well, he told them they're being a bad example. He told them no. Eli must have met Nancy Reagan. Just say no. Let's see what God said. I have told him that I will judge his house forever for the iniquity which he knoweth. Because his sons made themselves vile and he restrained them not. He was the magistrate. He was the spiritual leader. Whatever Eli was supposed to do, he didn't do it. But what he did say was, no, no, don't do that. What you're doing is, he gave him a nice lecture. Don't you know this is wrong? Don't you know you're an example? Don't you understand? Everybody's following you. You shouldn't be doing this. Uh -oh. I'm sure when the brothers were walking home, they said, Dad's going to be mad. Who cares? He's fat. He sits over there all the time. He doesn't do anything. He's not even going to get out of the chair. He's not going to get off the fence post. You, you know, Dad, he'll give us a lecture. But let's just hear the lecture. Go back to what we're doing. Judgment was brought upon his whole house by God. He was a little better than David. David wouldn't even tell Adonijah no. First Kings and his father had not displeased him at any time, saying, why hast thou done so? And he was also was a very goodly man. In other words, David could look at him and say, boy, he's a handsome son. Look at him, man, and he's nice and proper. But Adonijah didn't know his place. And he kept trying to get in front of his dad and getting ahead of his dad. And you could tell that this felt, you, you, you could see some people at, at a business or at a church or in a family. And you could say, boy, they're going to, they're, they're, they've got ambition. And they're going to try to usurp. But David, David would never tell him when he saw examples of the usurpation, he would never say, Adonijah, you're out of place, son. He wouldn't even tell him no. He wouldn't even tell him no. Praise God for parents that at least say no, but they don't do enough. But you've got some parents, they don't even say no. They'll be in a public place. Their, 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 their children are doing horrible things of all ages. They don't even say no. They're immune to it. They don't even hear it anymore. They don't even see it. Eli at least gave a lecture, told him no. Matthew Henry says Eli shunned trouble and exertion. He didn't want to do anything that would wear him out. You know, This led him to indulge his children without using parental authority to restrain and correct them when young. Eli's reproof was far too mild and gentle. Back in the 70s, it would be a woman with curlers in her hair, not even dressed, just wearing her uh, gown all day, and she's sitting down eating potato chips. And, and she's on the phone with her friend eating potato chips and watching soap operas. And the kids are going crazy, just going crazy. And she's like, stop that, be quiet, but not really ruling the house. Nowadays, it'd be social media, Facebook, all those things. But um, same example, same example. JFB commentary says he erred on the side of parental indulgence. And though he reprimanded them, he shrank from laying on them the restraints or subjected them to the discipline their gross delinquency called for. I don't want to drive them away, says Eli. You see what God's going to do to your whole house. Boy, you just read in the Bible when somebody doesn't do what they're supposed to do in their power. It's not in your power. It's not in your power. You just got to pray. John Gill, nay, my sons. 
This seems to be too soft and smooth, too kind. This is centuries ago. Nowadays, you're going to have people read that and they're going to say, wow, that was pretty good, Eli. <laughs> God didn't think it was. Oh, buddy. All right, let me read a few more verses. Thank you for your patience today. Proverbs 29. Reproof alone, alone gives wisdom. Words alone give wisdom. No, it doesn't say that. It says the reproof and the rod give wisdom. Nope, it doesn't even say that. The rod and reproof give wisdom. What was that for? Oh, I told you a long time ago not to touch that. You want to touch it again? Now come here. I love you. Be affectionate. But don't do that. Don't do that. There's no gambling. Now that gives wisdom. That gives wisdom. Consistency. Consistency. But a child left to himself brings his mother to shame. That's not just for an older one. It's got to start young. Because you're teaching that, that, that little symbol is a picture of hell. It's a picture of all God's judgments that he's going to bring upon you. It's a picture of you got drunk and hit a pregnant woman and killed her baby in your car. It's a picture of that whole destructive life that if they don't learn some sense right now, See, you're saving your child from hell and a hellish life. Oh, you got to do it diligently with love and kindness and affection. You got to do it. You got to do it early. You got to be. Proverbs 29. Correct thy son and he shall give thee rest. He shall give delight unto thy soul. You say, oh, I like that verse. It just says I just got to correct him, correct him, correct him. Well, well make, make sure you read the whole Bible, my friend. Proverbs 22, foolishness is bound in the heart of a child, but the rod of correction. He just told you earlier, rod and reproof, rod and reproof. That gives wisdom. That's the correction you need. Rod and reproof shall drive it far from him. Say, I love you, but you've got sin in your heart that you've allowed to fester there. You've got some foolishness and we're going to go open the window because we're about to drive it out of here. Okay, well, we're getting it out of here. We're getting it out of your heart, and we're going to chase it right out that window. You're not going to be a fool in this house. I'll call the UN. Well, you call the UN, but you'll know you had a daddy that loved you. Amen? You'll know you had a daddy that loved you. If they ever come over here and can stop me, then you'll know you had a daddy that loved you. That's what you got, that's what you got to be. Don't, don't be abusive. But the Bible says you got to have true love, man. You got to have true love. And the Bible says, if you don't do this, you hate your child. You really hate them. And you, and you, you young people, and those listening to this message, you, you might have children one day. I hope some of you do. You've got to learn this right now. You've got to learn it with your pets. You know, you can't just let your pets go crazy and go over and eat somebody's chicken and run out in the middle of the road. You, 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 and he's like, oh, my dog's dead. Well, you should have loved it. You, you should have taught it. You should have disciplined it. You, you should have. Taught your dog. I don't mean abuse your dog, but you got you got to train your dog. You, you got to learn right now that, that you have to train things or else they're going to go wild and end up in a mess. The Bible says do it early and he'll give rest to your soul. Show him that you got backbone. Let me give you two verses. You say, Pastor, let's get back to one thing. Can't you just tell the devil no? What if you tell him no in Jesus' name? He'll probably sit and laugh at you. He'll probably call his other buddies and his servants and say, we got another stupid Christian. He thinks he can stand up here and uh, say no in Jesus' name, and that's going to do something. They tried that in the book of Acts. And they went in with a bunch of devils, and they said, I, I come and... You know, I adjure you by Jesus, and they chased them out naked, man. Tore them up. They said, we know Jesus, we don't know you. Who are you? Hey, I believe in the name of Jesus. There's no other greater authority than in all the world. 
than God the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. And I believe in the name of Jesus, his son. But what I'm telling you is this. The Bible says in James 4, Submit yourselves therefore to God and resist the devil and he will flee from you. It just doesn't say, say no to him and he will flee. And that's the problem. Everybody's trying to say no, no devil, no, no, in Jesus' name, no, 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 dude, you got to resist. You got to fight. Then he'll run. He said, uh oh, uh oh, he's resisting. He's putting up a fight. He'll find somebody's easier prey. Even lions do that, man. The Bible says Satan's a lion looking who may devour. A lot of times they'll, they'll look at something and see him limping and they'll attack him. But if it puts up a fight, many of them say, man, I got to go get something else because they get kicked in the head. They're dead, you know. Many times a lion will say, man, I got to get easier prey. This is putting up a fight. Romans 8, for if you live after the flesh, you shall die. But if you through the spirit say no to the deeds of the body, you shall live. It doesn't say that. If you through the spirit do mortify. You say, what's that word mortify mean? It means put it to death. Slay it. If you through the spirit mortify the deeds of the body, that means deny them. Starve them. Resist. A fellow tells us in the 1800s, man, he was trying to get his liquor addiction. And he prayed to Jesus and said, Lord, help me. And he called his friends and says, listen, I got such a bad liquor addiction. I want you to lock me in this house and chain that door. And there's no windows. And no matter what type of screaming you hear in here, don't you let me out. Now you say, that sounds crazy. But this fellow, he, he, he looked at this and he took it as literal as you can. Now he didn't go do something crazy to himself, but that addiction came upon him. And it came upon him, and he began to scream and cry out and scream out, and his friends didn't open the door. But they came back, and, and he was broken. He was broken of his addiction. You, you just got to do something in Jesus' name. You got to fight, man. It's not going to be easy. Mortify, therefore, your members which are upon the earth, fornication, uncleanness, and ruin, affection, evil concupiscence, covetousness, which is idolatry, for which things sake the wrath of God comes on the children of disobedience. you got to cast them down. My last verse for you today, Titus 2, For the grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared to all men, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lust, not just saying no to it, but denying it. We should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world, looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Dear Holy Lord, thank you for folks that could endure this longer sermon, God. Oh, I just had something to say today, Father. And uh, I mean not to weary people, Lord, but Father, I do pray somebody. I pray many will get a hold of what I'm saying today, what you're saying through me especially these inspired scriptures, God. Father, we do pray we'll do things your way. Lord, how easy the devil can trick us. How sneaky he is, God. How crafty he is in his devices and ways and his guile. How he confuses us. And he'll just sit and laugh and mock. when He knows we're, we're missing the important thing. Oh, we should have fled long ago. Should have got away from the evil long ago. Help us learn, Lord, to flee when we can, to fight and resist. But never think we can just say no. And that's going to be enough for some people or for the devil himself. We love you, Lord. We thank you for the cross. We thank you for the blood of Jesus. Thank you for precious friends. Precious people that love you, Lord, and want to follow you. In Jesus' holy name, amen. Amen, folks. Anybody listening to this message, if God's calling you to the Ozarks, if God's calling you here, this is a good time. Come be a part of what we're doing here. And um, whatever you do, serve the Lord.
We love you all. God bless.